Hey guys, uh, we are picking up on slide 29 of chapter 11. Um, we are wrapping up our discussion of intermolecular forces. Um, just to hit on hydrogen bonding a little bit more, um, there's a list of, comp uh, list of properties on this slide um, that are directly affected by hydrogen bonding. Uh, specifically, we've already mentioned melting point and boiling point, that hydrogen bonding makes the molecules have higher melting points and boiling points than you would expect otherwise. Um, another one is uh, heat capacity and specific heat. Um, everybody in chapter 5 of 1211, I know you've heard the term specific heat. It's the amount of heat that it takes to raise a substance. If you have one gram of a substance, you want to raise the temperature by one degree Celsius. That's what the specific heat is. The heat capacity is a related value. But instead of heating up one gram and corresponding to that much heat, heat capacity is when you're dealing with a whole sample. It's the amount of heat to, that is required to raise an entire sample by one degree Celsius. Okay, so they're related to each other, just a technicality difference between them. Uh, also, solubility we haven't talked about a lot. Uh, we know that polar compounds tend to be soluble in polar solvents. Nonpolar compounds tend to be soluble in nonpolar solvents. Um, but specifically, molecules that can hydrogen bonding because they're extremely polar, they tend to actually make even stronger relationships with a polar solvent. So hydrogen bonding will increase the solubility of a compound in a polar solvent. Uh, it also affects vapor pressure. If the molecules of a liquid are strongly interacting, that means less of the fewer of the molecules can escape into the vapor. So it's gonna give you a lower vapor pressure for a liquid. Um, and then density, the stronger the hydrogen bonding is, the more the molecules get pulled closer together, um, and therefore the density typically increases, okay? Now, uh, just in your reading, more terminology. These are things I'm not gonna mention too much right now, uh, but these are common terms that you should be familiar with, what each one is. Um, you know, adhesion and cohesion. Those are the forces where adhesion is the ability of a molecule to stick to some other substance. Um, cohesion is the ability of molecules to stick to each other, okay? Cohesion, the fact that molecules stick close together, that's actually what's responsible for the high surface tension of water. Um, it had, the molecules have strong cohesion with each other. That's why if water is poured on a table, it tends to form beads or droplets of water instead of spreading out flat, which is what gasoline would do water beads up. Okay. Adhesion, uh, the fact that water sticks to other substances, that's why when you have like a burette or pipette, when you look at the level of the water, it forms a meniscus at the top, is because the molecules are attracted to the glass of the surface. Okay, so there's a lot of different things. Make sure you know these words and kind of how they're related to each other. And then specifically, viscosity is the resistance of flow or re resistance to flow for a substance. Like we know that um, water is a substance when you pour it out, it flows pretty freely. So it has a fairly low viscosity compared to something like honey or molasses, where things that can increase viscosity, of course, is stronger intermolecular forces, but also the size of the molecules when you have really big, long molecules that's gonna make them harder to flow over each other, which is why oil tends to be fairly thick, is because the molecules in oil tend to be long molecules. Okay, so again, terminology, you can actually calculate viscosity values, but the higher the value is, the less it is able to flow. All right, so comic, again, you can read through that, but I will say this comic illustrates sometimes how I feel when I'm teaching you guys. Um, the material you have to know. But uh, this p image here represents uh, when we talk about water, I just said a minute ago that hydrogen bonding can affect density of a substance. For the most part, that means that uh, when molecules can hydrogen bond, it's gonna increase the density of a liquid or a solid. Uh, kind of a special application or case of that is when we think about water, um, the density of water is about around one gram per milliliter um, at room temperature, it's pretty close to one. Uh, if we take water and freeze it, water is one of the few substances where the solid is actually less dense than the liquid. That's why ice floats um, in water, which again refers to the previous slide. Uh, now, why is that? You know, most of the time solids are more dense than liquids. Why is water an exception to that rule? Well, the answer is 
in the liquid, the molecules are all moving around each other, kind of flowing around. They have a certain attraction to each other that determines how far apart they are. That gives you a density for water. But when you slow the molecules down, when we lower the temperature, the molecules slow down, and eventually what happens is the hydrogen bonding is able to kind of kick in, and each water molecule will form four hydrogen bonds with other water molecules. It will form a hydrogen bond through both hydrogens, and it will form a hydrogen bond from both lone pairs. And that arrangement of hydrogen bonds, once you slow the molecules down, the molecules are kind of get rigidly trapped in those hydrogen bonding patterns. And what happens is the molecules kind of form these hexagonal structures where in the center of the hexagon, there's empty space. So in the form of ice, there's all these gaps in the center of the structure, which a gap is gonna lower the density. When you heat the water up, as the molecules start vibrating and moving, they fall into the center and with a liquid, since the molecules are all, always moving around, you're not gonna maintain those spaces anymore. So that's why the liquid is more dense than the solid is, okay? That again, is an exception uh, for water that's related to how strong the hydrogen bonding is. All right, and again, water has unusually high values for the surface tension, the heat capacity, which the heat capacity in biology, they talk about water has a high heat, heat capacity. That's important because our bodies are basically large aqueous solutions. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to raise our body temperature up by a degree or down by a degree. Uh, that's why uh, biologists talk about homeostasis. One of the things we have to do is maintain a constant body temperature. Okay. Uh, also high heat vaporization that is involved with sweating. If we have a droplet of water on our skin, for it to evaporate off, it has to absorb a lot of heat, which is how your body uses it to cool, because the heat from your body allows the vaporization to occur. Um, and then, of course, water is a good solvent for many things. Um, our blood is, water is the solvent, and there are tons of different things dissolved into our blood um, that are required for us to live. Um, I, I don't know, lots of different things there. Then we look at DNA. Again, previously I've mentioned the bonding pattern where adenine can only form a linkage with thymine um, in our DNA genetic code. Uh, if you look at it, it's because of the placement of the groups. So this is a thymine molecule. This is an adenine lump molecule. And basically there's a nitrogen with a partial negative here in a lone pair. It is placed perfectly, that partial negative right there to interact with the partial positive on the hydrogen of the, of the thymine. Also, up here I have an NH, that partial positive on the hydrogen is attracted to the partial negative of the oxygen and its lone pair, so there's another hydrogen bond there. So between adenine and thymine, two hydrogen bonds form that pair up perfectly in terms of their spacing and the arrangement of the groups to make strong interactions. If I look at cytosine and guanine, now there are gonna be three hydrogen bonding sites that again are, are arranged perfectly so that they match up well. This matching system is so precise that if you, when you talk about this in biology, your body will only make a mistake in pairing these one out of every 25 million pairings. So that's why the genetic code can be passed on from generation to generation uh, with so few mistakes. And then also when we, uh, form new DNA, so it's involved in uh, the pairing. It's also involved in the formation of the double helix. Uh, but again, every time a new one comes in, we form our hydrogen bonds, and that's how we pass on the code. So now we get into the next topic, phase changes. So uh, when substances go through phase changes, we need to know all the names. So when we have a solid, which is the lowest energy form of a substance, uh, if we heat it up, we can melt it or fuse it into a liquid. The opposite of that is freezing. Then we can take a liquid and vaporize it to a gas or condense. Vaporization, there are two different words. When you vaporize a substance at the boiling point, that process is called boiling. If we vaporize a substance below the boiling point, that's called evaporation. Also, from a gas, we can go straight from solid to gas is sublimation or gas to solid is deposition. We need to know all those terms. And then we've seen these before from chapter five. If I take a substance and heat up until it melts, 
the amount of heat that's involved in the melting process. We call that the heat of fusion or the delta H of fusion. If I heat a liquid up until it boils, there's a heat value involved called the heat of vaporization. And if I take, for some substances, they'll go straight from solid to gas. That would be the heat of sublimation is the value we need. Uh, from this graph, hopefully you can see the heat of sublimation for a substance is actually equal to the heat of fusion plus the heat of uh, vaporization. So the sum of these two should equal the sublimation value. Whether we're going up or going down, the values are the same. The difference is whether it's endothermic or exothermic. Anytime I'm going up in energy for my system, so energy has to go into the system, that's endothermic. Anytime I'm coming down, we have to release energy, so those would be exothermic. Just to look at a few different substances, uh, the heat of fusion, vaporization, and sublimation are all listed here. Again, you might notice that the heat of fusion and the heat of vaporization, if I add them together, they should be pretty close to equal to the heat of sublimation. All right, so we need to review some calculations. Uh, I'm kind of going to talk through these because I think they're pretty straightforward. Uh, when we get into harder problems, I'll start working them on the whiteboard. Uh, for the first one, how much heat is required to warm 50 grams of water from 25 degrees Celsius to 63 degrees Celsius? Um, if you want to think about it, stop the video, see if you know how to set it up, and then work your way to the answer, which is given here. Okay, so what you should have done if you just worked this problem, uh, heating up a substance within one phase um, should be the equation Q equals MC delta T, where Q is the amount of heat that's required. That's what it's asking for. Um, M is the mass, given as 50 grams of water. The specific heat of water you probably should know is 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius. Sometimes you see it as joules per gram per Kelvin. That's actually the same thing, because when I'm doing in the equation Q equals MC delta T, the delta T, whether the temperatures are in Celsius or in Kelvin, the difference between them should be the same. Okay, so what units you put on the specific heat aren't really that important. Celsius and Kelvin, either way you can work the problem and you'll need to convert. So for this one, it ought to be 50 times 4.184 times the delta T should be 38 degrees. So if you multiply those out, you should get 7,900, but that would be in joules, and then convert it into kilojoules. All right, so that problem should be straightforward and done. So now the second problem, um, how much heat is required to vaporize 50 grams of water at 100 degrees Celsius? Now, the only number that we would expect you to have memorized uh, relating to heat change values and that kind of thing, we, we should know the specific heat of liquid water. Okay? Any other numbers that you need to know, you look in your textbook, um, in the appendices at the end, look at appendix B, and in appendix B, it gives you a lot of the heat values for water. It gives you the specific heat of the solid liquid, excuse me, and gaseous water. It gives you the heat of fusion, the heat of vaporization, maybe even the heat of sub sublimation if you had the right conditions. Um, if you need the heat values for any other substances, you would be expected to look those up if needed um, for any given problem that you're doing, okay? On the test, any information like that that you need would be provided either on the formula sheet or we would list a, a table with the problem, okay? But here I'm doing vaporization. So if I look up the heat of vaporization for water, it's 40.67 kilojoules per mole. So basically, in order to vaporize one mole of water, it would require 40.67 kilojoules. Okay, that's found in Appendix B. So, if I want to use that number in this problem, I'm going to have to convert my grams of water into moles first. So I'm going to take 50 grams of water, divided by the molecular weight of water, which is 18. So 50 over 18 will give me the moles. And then once I know the moles, I should be able to multiply by 40.67 kilojoules per mole. The mole should cancel, that would give me the value. It should come out to be about 113 kilojoules. Okay, so those are two pretty simple problems that you should remember from chapter five. If not, go back and review some of that stuff uh, and we will move on. 
So, on this slide, I usually talk first. Uh, so imagine if I have a piece of ice and I take it out of the freezer, put it in a pot, put it on a stove, and turn on the oven, turn on or turn on the range. If you do that, and normally in class, if I had everybody in front of me, I would ask, okay, what happens first? Most of the people in class will shout out, the ice melts. Okay, that's usually the wrong answer because when I take ice out of the freezer, most freezers are actually set to a temperature that's well below zero. When you, when you put things in the freezer, you don't want them to just barely be frozen or be kind of slushy. If you want it to really be frozen, the temperature of the freezer is usually set down to like negative 20 or negative 30 degrees Celsius. And in order to melt it, you actually have to warm the substance up to zero before melting starts. Okay, now, if I take a piece of ice and throw it in a pan and turn the, the range on, uh, the bottom of the ice probably would warm up faster and so the bottom surface might start melting pretty quickly. But usually when we work problems in chemistry, we talk about the sample as a whole and we often assume that the heat has to be evenly distributed in order for us to do calculations. So, if I take a piece of ice out of the freezer, put it in a pan and start warming it up evenly, it has to warm up to zero which is going to require some heat. Then when it gets to zero, then the melting process is going to begin. The melting process, you have to absorb heat to turn the solid to a liquid. Then once we have liquid water, if we want to warm that water up, that's going to require more heat. Okay. Each step of this process is going to be a separate calculation that has to be done. We have to do a calculation to see how much heat it takes to warm up the ice to zero a calculation to see how much heat it takes to melt the ice, a calculation to see how much heat it takes to warm the liquid water up to whatever temperature we want to. We can take it all the way up to 100, but if we get to 100 degrees Celsius, at that point, the water is gonna start boiling. Again, every time we change to a different type of process, we have to do a separate calculation for that part, okay? Finally, after we boil all the water and turn it into a gas, then we can do one more calculation if we want to warm up the gaseous water to some higher temperature, we'd have one more calculation to do for that. So from what I just described, there are five different sections of what we're going to call a heating curve. If we draw the graph for a heating curve, uh, it's going to have five segments that we have to deal with. So if I look at the, this graph, it has two heating curves on it. And again, I told you, you have your ice that you have to warm up and then you have melting and then you have to warm up the liquid and then you have boiling and then you warm up the gas. So there are five segments for both of these graphs, substance A and substance B. So take a second and look at your heating curves. Hopefully you can zoom in enough to see um, which of these heating curves would represent water. Okay. The answer to my question is neither one of them. Neither of these represent water. These are two other random substances, okay? Uh, the way I know that is because the melting point and boiling point on these graphs should be specific to the substance that you're looking at, okay? Now, what do I mean by that? If you look at the graph, I can heat up the solid to a certain level, but this horizontal line right here should match up with the melting point of the substance. And then once I've melted it, I can heat up again. And then the second horizontal line represents the boiling of the substance. And then finally, I have the gas up here. So substance A on this heating curve, I could look at it and tell the, the melting point of substance A is around negative 30 degrees Celsius. And the boiling point of substance A is around probably 5 degrees Celsius or so. I'm estimating that. And then if I look at substance B, which has its own separate heating curve, again, the shape is the same, but it's shifted up. So substance B, the melting point is about 10 degrees Celsius, and the boiling point is, I want to say it's about 90 degrees Celsius. All right, so every substance, the heating curve will be a little bit different, but not too much. Okay, so I'm going to shift to my whiteboard. So essentially, if I'm going to draw the heating curve of water, 
So on my axes, I'm going to have the temperature in degrees Celsius on the y-axis. As I move to the left, or excuse me, move to the right, that's when I'm adding heat. So I'm going to have heat added. Okay. Now, as I progress, I'm going to start with a diagonal line. I'm going to go up. I need to mark my melting point. So I'm going to say zero degrees Celsius for water, and my boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. So I'm kind of just labeling my parts there. In the right spot. So I'm going to start with the diagonal line. I'm starting below zero. I'm going to heat up with a diagonal until I get to zero. That's the point where the solid will start to melt right there. So right now I have the solid ice or whatever substance at zero. If I keep adding heat, moving to the right, while a phase change occurs, you're always going to have a flat section. So that's a horizontal section, or at least close to it, representing the melting of water as I continue to add heat. As I add heat, I'm moving to the right. All right. Now. When I get to the end of that segment, that's the point where I've melted all my ice into liquid form. Okay, so right here I have liquid water at zero degrees Celsius. Now, a lot of people, when they talk about the freezing, uh, uh, the melting and freezing of water, they don't realize that the temperature stays the same the whole time. But when I talk about boiling, if you take a pot of water and put it on the stove and bring it to boiling, everybody knows water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. If I leave it on the stove and boil it for 20 minutes, the temperature stays 100 degrees the whole time. As the water's boiling, some of it boils away and turns into a gas, so the amount of water is going to shrink, but the temperature will stay at 100 the whole time. Okay, So that's a key. During a phase change, the temperature is constant, which is why I'm going straight across, because my y-axis is temperature. Now, once I've finished the melting, at that point, I can start heating up the liquid, so I'm going to heat up until I get to 100. That's the highest I can go in the liquid form. So at that point, I have to stop that calculation. If I still keep heating it, then I'm going to have the boiling process occur. And then after boiling, when I get to the end, that's when the last drop of water boils away. If I keep hitting it, heating it, then it's going to go up in the gaseous form. So I'm going to label solid, liquid, gas. And then the first horizontal is going to be melting, and the second horizontal is going to be boiling. So if we ask you on the test to draw and label a heating curve, this is what we're looking for. All right, now, next thing, how do we do the calculations? Each segment of the graph is going to be a separate calculation. So I'm going to call each segment, uh, the amount of heat is Q. So I'm going to call the first segment here Q1 then Q2, then Q3, then Q4, then Q5. There are five calculations that can be done. Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5. Each calculation, there's a specific setup that I have to be able to do. All right, now, the diagonal line, I'm heating up the solid, I'm heating up the liquid, and I'm heating up the gas. The three sol uh, diagonal lines, which is Q1, Q3, and Q5, anytime I'm warming a substance up within a phase, the equations can be the same. We've done it before. It's Q equals MC delta T. So Q1, when I set that one up, anytime I'm heating up a solid, I'm going to do MC delta T. Okay? If I'm heating up a liquid, same equation, MC delta T. And then when I'm heating up a gas, same thing, MC delta T. Now, Q2 and Q4 are phase changes. Again, we did a problem a few minutes ago. To, to do a phase change, you have to find the right delta H. It could be the heat of vaporization, or it could be the heat of fusion. Okay? In some cases, it could be the heat of sublimation depending on the problem that you're doing. But you find that right delta H value, and then what we did earlier, we took the heat of, it was heat of vaporization in kilojoules per mole, and we multiplied it by the moles, okay? So I'm gonna set this up, Q2, which is from melting, it's gonna be M 
times delta H. And for melting, it's going to be the heat of fusion. So the delta H of fusion. Now, the trick here, though, you have to be careful of the units. Delta H sometimes can be given in kilojoules per mole. But occasionally, you have a problem where they give you the delta H for a substance, and it'll be in like kilojoules per gram. Well, M has to match up with whatever units delta H is. If delta H is kilojoules per mole, then M needs to be moles. If delta H is kilojoules per gram, then M has to be the mass or the grams. Okay? So you got to really watch your units to make sure that you're plugging things in the right way. And then finally, Q4, same idea as Q2. It's a phase change. It's going to be M times delta H of vaporization. But again, whatever units of the amount of substance in delta H are given, your M has to match up so the units cancel out. So these are my five equations, but really three of them are similar and then the other two are similar. Okay. Now, the last thing to watch out for, actually two more things. One, on Q1, Q3, and Q5, they're all MC delta T, but I want you to realize that for every substance, the specific heat, which is the, the value for C, the specific heat is actually different in the solid form, the liquid form, and the gaseous form. So you have to look those up for all three and make sure you plug them in the right spot. Okay? Last thing, when we do a process, and let's just say I did a problem where I was heating up a piece of ice from some temperature all the way until it goes up to be um, steam at some higher temperature. If they ask you what's the total amount of heat involved in that process, well, you're going to have to do all five calculations. Then you would add them together to get Q total. And that would probably be the answer for the question. The last thing to worry about, though, is our units, Q1, Q3, and Q5, are usually going to come out to be in joules. Q2 and Q4 are often going to come out to be in kilojoules. When we work these problems, a lot of times we end up with pretty big answers. So most of the time, in like mastering chemistry or whatever homework or whatever you're doing, most of the time the final answer they want it to be in kilojoules. So you got to figure these answers out, put them all in kilojoules, then add them together to get the total. Okay, that's our overall process that we have to do. I think in my next video, we'll work some problems that will involve that. Okay, I'm going to cut this one off.